would they want to donate to the dog park if they could? Would they want to pay memberships, a monthly membership, if we had to do a membership system? So we wanted to gather all that information um, via social media and this event and other ways. Next slide. So next comes research. Um, this is a screenshot of our registration page for the Mission Dog Park. We'll have a Facebook group over the event when you click tickets. So we'll go to this free registration page where I sneakily added in some survey questions <laughs> such as if there was a permanent dog park in Mission, how often would you use it? And um, this park would be privately funded. Would you be willing to make a one-time donation if asked? How much would you be able to make? So we can get some of that information before the event even happens. Next slide. Fourth step, locate. This is a tricky one. So we're very excited to locate a dog park, and I think a lot of other things will fall into place once we do have a location. Some of the locations we have looked at are Lamar West um, Quick Trip, Antioch Park, Mohawk Park, Broadmoor Park, uh, the Bacon Lot near Primera, Streamway Park. Um, specs for the location, 1 to 1.5 acres or larger. We'll take what we can get adequate parking, shade, and access to water. So this step is fundraise, which could be very fun. Ooh, can you go back, please? Yep, our goal is $1,000. Um, until we come up with a location. $100. Sorry, $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> I can check right now. Yeah. <laughs> I was just coming here to get $1,000 tonight from you guys. Yeah, we'll still take that $1,000 check right now. You're probably good, so I'm not worried. to get donations from individuals, donations from businesses. There's a lot of pet center businesses on Johnson Drive, and we hope they'll be really excited about this too. Um, this comes monetary donations, goods donations, such as tennis balls, or uh, Ottawa has tires for dog toys. Um, also services, tree cutting down services, anything like that could be considered a donation, and we're hoping to get a lot of local businesses really excited and involved in this. And at our last meeting, someone said, was it Kristen who said yes. this? We need a piece of land and a hundred grand. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and you can see from that's the, right. you're fine. You can see from that picture, we went to Ottawa and Advantage Ford is a car dealership in Ottawa. They were the biggest um, donor for the dog park. So their logo is on every single sign possible at that dog park. So they definitely got their money's worth with the advertising and PR right there. And if you go on more, this is something else. This is a humongous sign um, at the front of the dog park, which has different programs where people, um, where they recognized um, businesses and individuals that donated a lot of money towards the dog park. So we will have some um, fundraising recognition programs as well. Okay, build and maintain. These will be not totally planned out until we have a location. Um, we have talked about it quite a bit in our group so far, in our small time as a group, and then with gained ideas from the task force and with Ottawa. So some non-negotiable items we really want is a six-foot fence. Wherever the dog park is, it's going to be around cars. So we really want to keep the dog safe. Don't want anyone jumping over a four-foot fence. So six-foot fence. Um, we also want large dog, small dog area. Um, we also want a unleashing zone, if you will, if you've been to a dog park and have that unleashing zone. So just to make it all safer. Um, and for maintain, Ottawa does cleanup days. They've only had a few because they've only needed to have a few because the residents were so excited to get a dog park. They've taken such good care of it. They clean up after themselves, but they do have cleanup days where people volunteer to pick up extra dog poop or pick up trash. Um, the expectation would be that everyone would clean up after themselves, but that won't happen 100% of the time. So we'll have those cleanup days too. So how can you help? Um, location recommendations would be very great if you guys had ideas or knew of anything else that we haven't thought of yet. Um, cooperation with Johnson County and other Northeast Johnson County city and municipalities. If we do find a great location that's maybe not in Mission but close to it, if we get some cooperation there. Um, cooperation with fundraising efforts, if you can get involved in whatever way you personally can. Um, social media sharing. Follow us on social media, share it to your friends. Hopefully they'll share it with their friends. Luckily this community is pretty small, so hopefully we can get everyone in mission knowing about this. And pop-up dog park attendants, you're all invited with your dogs or without your dogs, it doesn't matter. Questions? 
you have a size recommendation for the park? I mean, could, we, could you use an existing park and split it up so you could do park, dog park, and park? Mm -hmm. What's what's your requirement for size? <laughs> and I think the the one and a half acres is like Where really right? as small as you want. Okay. 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 Especially more than that. So you need more, really. I do. I got a question. How did you come up with a hundred thousand dollar goal? So Ottawa had a thirty thousand or they had a fifty thousand dollar goal. They got thirty thousand dollars and made it work. We thought Ottawa's a smaller community. Prices are probably cheaper there, so we just more than tripled it. Yeah, we're gonna have to based on what uh, we can look at that a little, a little yeah. bit too. Like what it it's really tough to know what we're gonna for sure need until we get a, a location idea more pinned down, I think, to really start to look at some costs. Yeah. And I have a question because you were talking about private funding and I didn't remember that being the discussion last time, so I was wondering how that evolved and if you're talking about a hundred thousand in private and then some city funds or where kind of that's we'll take any city well. funds. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've gotten that far down the road. I, I, I do remember in the, in the stuff that we had talked about before to not use any existing city right. funds that are earmarked for the parks. Um, I think sustainability-wise, you know, the city's going to have to be involved at some point, but I think to get it off the ground. Yeah. Uh, I noticed on your social media you did not include nextdoor.com. Are you familiar oh, with that? Oh, yes, I am. I'm not very active, but I would love to know more about it. Well, the reason I ask is that most, uh, one of the features in nextdoor.com are pet owners have pets uh, okay. registered there. And so by neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood can identify who are the pet owners uh, that have dogs. So basically that may be a, a means of reaching dog owners. Okay, thank you. Yes, we'll definitely do that. You are just that you're doing margin. Who is on? Is the same people that are on the task force on this, or who is on? No, who is it's, on this? it's residents. There's some city council members on there just for fun. Um, Hillary, Nick, and Kristen are on, and um, Christy comes to all our meetings as well. But mostly just residents, and there's I think 12 of us. Well, so far. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, we got a couple yeah. other people that have reached out to me too that I think they passed their contact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to come to the meetings because you're excited, we totally invite you. And if you have any friends or if you know any business owners that would want to come, we'd love them. So people that would like to donate. Yeah, people that would like to donate. Yeah, yes, yes. At that hundred thousand dollars. I assume Chris counts all meetings because it's parks and yes. recreation type of thing. And we would definitely want her involved in that. But uh, what I can't believe if you've been looking at it for this long that you haven't come up with an idea on the location. Uh, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with Screenway Park? It's like yeah, everything you just mentioned. A lot of area, parking, shade. I could be wrong, but I don't believe we own Screenway mm -hmm. Park's drive up. Yeah, no, so this is, what? yeah, this is something that we talk about at every meeting because <laughs> there's very, I did not realize, personally, I'm sure you guys know a lot more than I do, but that the city of Mission does not own all the parks in Mission. So right. some are owned by Johnson County, some are owned by the state of Kansas, and they will not let us touch those land, that land. Um, well, that narrows it down for you. <laughs> yes. So I, I think we have several different options and several ideas, and um, we'll be working on those kind of behind the scenes. That we're, we're looking at, I think, just about everywhere we can. Well. 90% of the locations that we're interested in looking at are locations here in the city of Mission. There are a couple others in surrounding communities. Oh, really? We would have to reach out to some of those people and maybe even some of the land okay, that we're looking at. Right. Yeah, some of them, some of the land right. is owned by other people and we may have to, you know, work and see if there isn't something we can do cooperatively with them. But we haven't approached any of those people yet, so okay. I don't want to go too much into mm -hmm. detail on that. Awesome. Yeah, our goal is to find a park in Mission or in a surrounding city in Northeast Johnson County, but hopefully in Mission, because it kind of it was with my name. Was that supposed to be listed? Um, I think some people have reached out to the county about that, and it sounded like that it was kind of like that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. I know with Streamway, there's challenges too with the access to it. And to put that, apart, right? that could that could be a big concern. If you start having a lot more traffic going through there, we you know, potentially have to do some stuff to change the, the access to that park. Yeah, it's a private street currently. We don't own oh, that. Right. Right. Yeah. So well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, traffic though. How much traffic does out of get at their dog park? I think I know how much traffic I get yeah. at my park. Water park. Can I get yeah, what? Yeah, you yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think it's things that we've tried to keep in mind uh, as we're comparing. We have so many, so many other dog parks in the metro area we can compare to, and the task force actually saw a lot of those. We specifically went to Ottawa because they had the Friends of group, which is what we're right. trying to start. And when you look at Ottawa, I think they said their population is right around 13,000. But they are a rural community, so they really are only serving 13,000 people. Right. Here, even though our population is just shy of 10,000 people, we are serving a, a much greater population. We may be serving a 40 or 50,000 population. So for us to say what we come in to work. But, well, not only who come. Just, yeah, just anybody who lives within, say, a 5, 10, 15 mile radius who oh, says, okay. hey, I want to go to that dog park. Are you some Because the closest parks are really like Newwood and Shawnee Mission Park, so we should be the only centralized location in North East Johnson County. Well, do we have an idea what kind of traffic well, to get the other dog parks? So I yeah, think we've got some numbers from Newwood mm -hmm. before, and I can go and put those up. I was just curious. Yeah. And then, you know, other things we take into consideration when we think of that is if we only have an acre and a half. Of space to work with, how many dogs can that really accommodate? And if right. it is in mission, uh, do we restrict that to mission residents or individuals within a five mile radius of mission? Do we sell memberships to that and have a box card entry into the park? And there's still a lot of things we have to think about, a lot of processes that have to go through it. But I think, as, as uh, Nick mentioned and as Christina has mentioned, until we know where it's going to go and what we can have. Yeah, first we, things first. Yeah, we aren't going to be able to make any of those other uh, conclusions or decisions. Do we have a goal as to when we're going to be finished looking? Or? Uh, as soon as possible. Well, Location well, has yeah, been the uh, trickiest yeah, part of this, surprisingly. I know Ottawa mentioned that they were hoping to, that they, they were working on a three year time frame once they kicked their park kicked their group off and said, hey, we want to have it up and running in three years, which I think is a realistic goal. And they actually accomplished it in a year. I want you to know I had a contact today from someone whose grandson's working on their Eagle Scout. And I gave them big swing because they want to know how they can get on board once a dog park is established in this area for a possible amenities for an Eagle Scout. So I gave them a Thank, Thank you so much. We were actually talking about Eagle Scouts doing yeah. poop, box, poop box, uh, <laughs> back projects and paths. And yeah, that's a great idea. Yep. Thank you so much for doing that. So Chris, do you have like, identified any mission parks that we can, they're your parks that uh, you, you think, yeah, this is the one that would be the best for you know, not, not any that I'd like to throw out right now. I think <laughs> they all warrant additional conversations before we stir up any type of, you know, pure. pure. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the thing with it, right, is if we do use one of the existing mission parks, which I think is a, a very realistic thing that we're going to have to consider, some of the, somebody's going to lose out on something, right? Now, if that means that we're all of a sudden seeing 40, 50 people a day, or maybe it's not that many, maybe day like tonight where it's not so nice, you only get a couple of people that go out there. If you start seeing more usage there, is it worth it as a whole for the city? I, I think we have to, we as a group have to blow them out a little bit and see what's best for the community. Yeah. Do we have a breakdown of how many acres each park is? Absolutely. Yeah. It's in the mission. It's, it's in the, the, the uh, master plan. Yeah. So would, uh, it's even in the activity guide. Water One be willing to let you do it at Waterworks Park? Well, you know, they've got all that pump system. Well, the parking there is there. Are other like parking is a big, big challenge there. I don't, I don't want to get calls from Pat Quinn. Seven thirty at night, and there's too many people with their dogs trying to park in the driveway. Well, it's already pretty much a dog park. Well, everybody goes out there for dogs. Oh yeah. I know another another couple parks. I think we could say that too. Too, we see dogs running around all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any, any park at this point that is off the table as well as there aren't any other maybe privately owned spaces of open land uh, that are not off the table at this point. It's just us having those those conversations with those individuals before we talk about it publicly in a okay. public meeting. I think Let's that's what's season. so cool about the pop-up dog park is because it's going to get the word out and if anyone does have the contacts, it'll... it'll and plus all the social media work that Christine is doing, I think, will be fantastic. Have you heard any negative feedback about Dr. Well, we don't listen to any of that. I've had a couple people say that they're concerned about cost, but I think that's why we're going to try to be as responsible as we can about getting it up and running through private money and grants that are out there. So I have a number of grants that 
there was a property, um, Scott Babcock, in fact, had a large lot that he split about a year ago and sold the north half of this property. And that property is actually uh, about to be built. So those plans have been submitted and approved by the city. And I think the, um, the developer is going to start breaking ground here this summer on that. Do you remember what the width of those two lots were? I think it's similar. It's not, They're about 60? Yeah. Because they were pretty narrow. Yeah. Similar to this neighborhood. Okay. Areas, uh, okay. That's the one that comes to mind right now. And then the Glenwood, did that split? Was there a split lot on Glenwood recently? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then was, was that similar to 60 feet? Because that looked like it was pretty small. But I mean, guess what? Okay. All right, very good. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. All right, next up we have an action item for the Spencer Powell Cargo Lease, Christy. And uh, please bear with me, I'm going to go ahead and read the information for my action item just because I think there's a lot of really good information in it. I want to make sure everybody hears all that. But since 2009, uh, most all of the community center's cardio equipment, which includes treadmills, elliptical stationary bikes, those types of equipment, uh, have been replaced through a lease agreement with advanced fitness equipment rather than an outright purchase. This has allowed the city to keep the most current and te technically advanced cardio equipment in the facility and to help minimize repair costs by retaining equipment only as long as it is under full warranty. The equipment secured under the 2015 lease agreement is now ready for replacement and staff has worked with Advanced Fitness to put together a proposal which best meets the needs of the community center. And a list of all of that equipment was attached in your or included in your packet. There were three primary factors which impacted our decision to continue leasing from Advanced Fitness instead of soliciting competitive bids, and that includes the first <coughs> Advanced Fitness holds the state contract for fitness equipment, meaning that uh, the state of Kansas solicited competitive bids from fitness equipment suppliers, <coughs> and Advanced Fitness submitted the lowest and best bid to the state. Second, that Advanced Fitness provides us with a guaranteed buyback of the equipment at the end of the lease term. And finally, because of the televisions that we have on our current cardio equipment are detachable and only compatible with Advanced Fitness equipment. That way, we don't have to replace the televisions every time we replace equipment. We, can only, we just replace televisions on an as-needed basis. The city's financial advisor, Ellers Incorporated, secured competitive quotes for the transaction. And again, you have that information all included in your packet. We had three firms responding uh, to, the, to the request. Kinetic Leasing, Inc. presented the best bid with an interest rate of 3 point, or, I'm sorry, 2.738%. And there was a re resolution prepared by the city's bond council, Gilmore and Bell. Leasing and or escrow agreement documents will also be reviewed by and approved by Gilmore and Bell. The equipment is recommended to be secured through advanced fitness with a lease held by Kinetic Leasing. The total amount to be financed over the three-year term is $210,000 and includes 34 pieces of equipment and all costs associated with the transaction. Advanced fitness, the equipment vendor, will purchase the equipment at the end of the lease term for an agreed-upon price. As the schedules demonstrate, the total interest cost over the term of the lease are $9,638.25 and cost of issuance are $8,500. So, proposed financing strategy continues to allow the city to maintain top of the line equipment while minimizing expenditures for repairs and avoiding dramatic spikes in capital equipment expenditures. So and the uh, funds are budgeted from the Special Parks and Recreation Fund for this lease agreement. All right, any questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, page two, you, you outlined the amounts for each of the years, yes. 2018. I assume that that's because it starts in the middle of our budget year, is that right? That is correct. Hey, Christy. I noticed that back in 2015, I just went back to look at what you know, we spent back then, and it was just around one, 169000 And I feel like going up to 210, which I understand inflation, but I feel like that's a large jump. Is there any reason that Advanced Fitness gave as far as, as far as are we ordering more equipment than we previously had? Or? There is more equipment, and the equipment changed. So, yep, 
it's not an apples to apples comparison exactly the same thing that we purchased or that we leased at that time. So, and they're like, now we have more uh, power mills than what we had at that time. And so those different pieces of equipment cost different amounts of money. And so what, we, <clears throat> what we're able to do is monitor the usage of each piece of equipment. We can actually log in, see how many miles go on each piece of equipment how many hours each piece is used, and so we're able to tell which pieces are used more than others. You also know from people standing around waiting to use equipment what you need to make adjustments in. So we know that we can get rid of, you know, one of our flex striders. So we're going down a flex strider and up recumbent bikes and up power mills, and so just to shift well, to more. Personally, more. I'm excited to see an addition of the, I don't know what you call them, but the higher bikes, the, the bikes with the lifted seat. So I'm excited that you're getting another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always waiting for that one. Okay. Hopefully. So. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, in terms of space requirements, did they back up the space? It, it'll pretty much swap out it piece will. for piece where we're at. So everything everything will definitely fit in. Thank you. Okay. This might not be appropriate now, but in the next uh, six months or so, would you be able to give us some kind of estimate of any changes reflected? as we look at revenues and revenue streams and impacts there. Perfect. Definitely. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Next up, we have your recommendation. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Mercy. I'm mm -hmm. ready to take that. Sure. I just said. Part of the point. Can I work right? <laughs> yes. Uh, can I also recommend? <laughs> sure. Consent. Sorry, I think I forgot oh, that we're on action. Yeah. All right, John, Broadmoor Design Contract. Good mm -hmm. evening, everybody. Um, this task order is for design. Uh, it, it actually does survey design, uh, bidding services, and uh, engineering during construction for the Broadmoor project that we have as a CARS project for 2019. Um, we originally completed the design through conceptual design back in 2011 uh, with Olson. So basically what this uh, task order will do is take from the conceptual design and, and build on that and move us through preliminary and final design. Um, back in 2011 due to some some concerns with some property owners and other projects in queue we, we basically shelved this project. Um, back then it was a fully city funded project uh, back in 2017, we did the studies required to make this a CARS eligible route. So now we have 50% getting contributed from, from the county uh, on this project. Um, tomorrow evening, we're going to have an open house uh, for this project. Uh, we're, we're taking off essentially from where we left as far as uh, conceptual design went. say there's a lot of things that changed in this corridor so this project seems a lot more appropriate now um, so we're, we're like I said we're, we're starting with our concept that we had back in 2011 and this task order will take us through and take us through fruition of the project so with that being said I would be happy to answer any questions you may have are you coordinating that open house it is when you say coordinating, I mean, are you the leader, the leader of the open house? Are yes, open yes. House? So you'll be taking the questions. I, I will be taking the questions. Okay. I had uh, one question about the 2011 contract. You said yes. you know, by sticking with Olson, we can build on that. So is there a cost savings in this new contract? There is. We originally budgeted $182,000 for design, but being that we're kind of already through that conceptual phase with Olson, it. it it will help us okay. in, in, in the cost savings department for sure. Since 2011, since we look at this particular part of the, the area, mm -hmm. is there anything they can look at relative to the makeup of the concrete or whatever we end up using based on the traffic pattern in that area that would keep the road better or longer? Yeah, I'll tell you, we, we've come a long ways. Um, uh, that road was probably initially built 50 years ago. 
Um, there's a lot better material now. Um, here about 15, 20 years ago, we went through a time period that we were actually just talking about the other day with concrete that they hit a shelf of limestone that had a bunch of shale in it. Well, it all started failing prematurely. So I, when I lived in Lee Summit, you know, that was the period that they used that concrete. Well, all our curbs were falling apart, and, and they came through and had to redo a lot of that. But uh, the, the technology and the material have definitely come a long way. Um, you know, we use KCMMB concrete, which is the Kansas City Metro Materials Board. Um, they've kind of shied away from the limestone and have been using granite, which, which helps um, with, the, with the life expectancy of concrete. Um, we're using different types of asphalt now. Um, a lot of the asphalt we've been using is the Overland Park Spade Super Pave asphalt. Um, it's probably the most used asphalt in the metro right now. And it's probably the most heavily scrutinized too, because Overland Park just likes messing with their stuff. So, um, and, and they do a lot of testing to see how it acts and, and you know tweaks it to make sure that it's it's performing the best that it can. So I, I think those things have come a long ways that will help. And and you know get some extra stormwater infrastructure on that street, you know to get the Overland flow underground. You know, all those things will, will definitely make it to where it's a, a long-lasting project for sure. We don't have any weight restrictions on that side. No. The only real weight restrictions that we have in town right now are just for the bridges. So you'll see low limits as you drive down and you're getting ready to cross a bridge. You know, they'll have the low limit posted. Yes. Hmm? Good yeah, let's take a council of consent and on. No. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. Can we roll away? Michael, ain't we're yet. Oh, yeah. Guardrails. <laughs> <laughs> My most favorite thing in the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the, the proposal that you all have in your packet from Collins and Herman is for the replacement of a couple sections of guardrails that got damaged over uh, the winter. The first is down at the corner of Lamar and Fox Ridge. Uh, looks like a uh, long trailer <laughs> took the corner a little too sharp and uh, kind of looked like he messed up a few th other things along the way, but fortunately for us, that's the only piece that we came through with damage on. Um, then the other section is a piece up on 50, about 5,500 Fox Ridge, just south of the AT&T building. Looks like over the winter somebody may have uh, found the curb and jump the curb and hit the, hit the guardrail. So um, we had Collins and Herman come out. They gave they kind of broke down our pricing options. The first option was just to replace the, the damage section at, at Lamar and Fox Ridge. Um, and then option two and three uh, were to replace that section and the section at 5500 Fox Ridge. The first price on option two was basically to replace the guardrail as it was. Um, the current setup of that guardrail doesn't meet any type of standard due to the ends being the way that they are. So what we are uh, recommending is option three, which would put the standardized K dot ends on that guardrail uh, for the terminations. Um, we, we had some guardrail we had to replace a couple years ago. Um, when we were searching for contractors to do this work, Collins and Herman seems like, or from what we could find, we were really the only ones here in the metro that did that. Um, we've contacted MoDOT, KDOT, some other cities, and they said, well, we either replace it ourselves or we have Collins and Herman to do it. So um, we would recommend option number three to replace both of those sections of guardrail to the KDOT center.
And if you've driven by there lately, you'll see a sign up that says, no parking pass, May 14th, lot closed. They're going to start demolition the third week of May. So the demolition will be kind of light at first with some trees and some kind of stuff around the lot, but they'll really get into it in June. They'll bring the building down, they'll take out all the asphalt, um, so they're going to start rocking and rolling with this. So, yeah, exciting news. Are we going to have to change any traffic patterns or anything? The truck routes, are, the primary truck route is going to be out of the lot on Beverly, south down the Martway, and then west on Martway to Lamar, south of Lamar to Shawnee Mission Parkway, and west of Shawnee Mission Parkway to 35. Because Call Valley's got a large uh, demolition pit or something out in southwestern Johnson County where they dispose of all of this. So. Uh, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, but it could be a right away dedication or rededication or something like that. Yeah. Yes. So as part of the uh, Mission Trails project, um, the owner of the property now, EPC, they officially own the property, has agreed to dedicate the front portion of the property to the city as right of way. And that was the dedication that you all approved in the last meeting. And so we'll have on street parking on Johnson Drive, and then we'll have sidewalk and streetscape and so forth. The uh, agreement that's before you tonight is a task order with Olson Associates, our on call engineer, to actually review the plans for that and do the inspection. So uh, Crossland, the contract's going to be building the work. But we need somebody to inspect it just to make sure that it conforms to our standards and that it um, meets the specifications of the plan. And there's also some additional items. There's a stormwater channel that kind of comes through the property, but that's it right there. There'll be a connection to that that Olson will, that's ours, the stormwater channel. So they'll be reviewing the plans for that to make sure the connection's proper. And then things like erosion control on the site during the construction process. And then the stormwater pollution prevention plan, which has been filed with the state, they have a permit, but we'll need somebody to make casual observations of that throughout the process to make sure that they're complying with that. So tonight's task orders for all those things is amount not to exceed seventy-two thousand four hundred thirty-eight dollars and fifty cents. Any questions or comments? Uh, you know, the only is that. That amount is refunded to Yes, that's right. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that part of our development agreement, that would be reimbursed by the developer. Good point. Last year this kind of snuck up on us, and so we wanted to make sure that we at least got uh, it out there a little bit ahead of our council meeting, but according to our ordinances, committee chairs uh, are selected um, prior to the first council meeting in June. So at your May council meeting, um, we would recommend that you would consider appointing uh, a new or appointing chair and vice chairpersons of community development and the finance and administration.
for a guy. Just, just a water meter. We have to get a water meter, and trust me. Draw the sure we yes. get. <laughs> have the right tag. Yeah, the right yes, tag. He is, he, we have upped our game. <laughs> <laughs> we're making sure we have the water, correct water meter. So, um, yes. Um, we have a lot of water meters
take action to waive the requirements of Chapter 205 of our city code um, to allow for those fireworks. And then uh, typically at the same time, we've asked that you authorize uh, funding uh, for the trains to purchase the fireworks. Yeah. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think we need to continue doing that. I'd like to see the uh, budget this year for the fireworks at uh, about seven hundred and fifty dollars.
either as a council member or a staff um, provide that follow-up and, and close that communication loop. And then we just, again, tried to set, uh, included a bullet point that talked about um, trying to create a civil uh, environment um, and an opportunity for uh, a more productive uh, conversation. And I know in doing a gender review that Council Member Flora had some concerns about some of the language included in that. And I've taken this language out of the City of Shawnee's policy, but based on um, some of the issues that I think the school board has been uh, criticized for recently, um, that certainly we, you, you may want to, if we move forward with this, consider um, revising. I think your suggestion was to take out personal and impertinent, impertinent um, potentially. Yeah, yeah, that was my recommendation. I know that personal in particular is what the school board uh, got sideways with the ACLU about. Um, so yeah, taking out personal and impertinent, I think, you know, leaving it slanderous or someone is being disruptive to the proceedings, that that makes sense. But I personally think, you know, we're public officials. If so someone has something to say to any of us specifically, they should be allowed to do that. And then the only other change uh, was just adding a point of clarification under responsibilities of the committee chair that conducting meetings of the committee would include then managing the public comment section. And I think if you'll notice, on the face of your agenda, we have historically included public comments at the top of that agenda. So the thought being, um, and, I, and I think you heard the mayor do it at the last council meeting where he sort of uh, provided an introduction that um, there would be a, a point on the agenda for public comment on something not related to a specific agenda item, and then that the, the council would take comment uh, as each, if it were on a specific agenda item, as that agenda item was raised and discussed, and we would recommend a similar format for the committee meetings. So will the um, agendas here then say, like, item number one, then public comment opportunities, or... I think we can. We, because I know that you've got public comments here. I think we can absolutely make it clear if, if, the, if that may be more helpful to just um, include that. Um, yeah, yeah, it would be helpful to me. For sure. <laughs> to remember to invite the public. <laughs> <Yes. Okay. laughs> Thank you. Now, this, this is not, we're not moving this forward. It's something that is, how is it going to be active? So if you're comfortable with these changes or with these recommendations, with the changes uh, that Councilmember Flora recommended, then we would uh, give this to uh, Dave Martin for a quick legal review, and then we would bring it back next month as an action item. Okay. Um, and I agree. Let's go ahead and make the Next up, we have an update from Chief Hadley on the Police Department over hiring process. Um, as we've discussed, uh, in 2017, we talked about uh, the ability of the Police Department to overhire by two positions and find that diamond in the rough, as we called it. Um, we've made good use of that. Um, right now, we our optimum level is 29. As Laura and I have talked about recently, the police department hasn't done anything with its staffing since 2005. At least. At least. So it's been at least 13 years since we've adjusted the department at all. Um, but we haven't done a lot of building and things like that. There's a lot coming up in the future, but that's another conversation down the road. Um, so 29 is our optimal number. Um, right now I'm sitting at 30 officers. I have one opening still if we were to overhire by two. We have had some certified people that have applied. Uh, in our opinion, not to the quality that we're looking for. So we don't want to take anybody again. It's down in the rough that we're looking for. Um, out of those 30 people, one of them is in Afghanistan for this year, Tanner Eddings. So I'm really at 29. I have two people in field training, so now we're 27, and I have four people that are going to graduate the police academy this Friday night. So now I'm down to 23 people. So starting next Sunday, we will be field training six people at one time, which is the most that we've ever done. Uh, four is the most people we've ever had in the police academy. So by the middle of August, all of those people should be done, assuming everybody passes and everybody can breathe a little bit easier downstairs. Um, but that's essentially where we are. Um, there for a while, we were running the department with 21 people, which
which is not easy to do. But I applaud all those people downstairs for what they've done. So we do currently have one opening. If we do get that diamond that rolls through the door, then I'll certainly take it. But uh, otherwise, again, I said, uh, you know, with some of the buildings coming up, that's another conversation to have. But uh, glad to always have it. Yes? Are all our academy people expected to graduate on part? I hope so, because I'm showing up. So, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, they're in uh, situationals right now. And this is rubber meets the road. So it's but so far everybody's been doing just fine as of this afternoon. So Great. stress test. Mm -hmm. uh, That's it. And you you'll be bringing your ones that are through field training. You're making some introductions at the council meeting in May. Where are you going to wait? Um, we usually wait until people are out of field training. That way we know that they've passed everything that, that Kirk has done to them downstairs, <laughs> and and that we're good. Uh, we have had some people in the past that haven't made it through field training. Um, so my. I do have an award that I need to present in May if it shows up in time. If it doesn't show up in time, um, but I will tell you that it's the first that the city's ever issued. So, yes. Chief, uh, are we still considering uh, community service officers? Um, are you going to be looking to put that in the 2019 budget? Or? That's actually a conversation Laura and Dan Matt and I have a meeting tomorrow night with that group. Yes, and I'll well, touch on it when I'll we and, I, and I'll touch on it and when we talk about budget goals. But yes, okay. we're, we are going to recommend that for 2019. Okay. So that lends itself to the next phase of us looking at police protection with all these different departments going on. Correct. That, that's my recommendation, and it would, in my opinion, it would depend when are the doors going to open. And I'll, I'll bring a tabler or a table of stuff on. This is our recommended positions, and then it's going to be up to you what you guys would like to fill or not fill, but I'll bring you needs, not wants. So, any other questions? It's not raining yet. Thank you. Yes. Uh, last, yeah. last discussion item that we have tonight is just the, uh, the selection of the committee chair and vice chair. Same song as the
economy uh, and in a community over that period of time. So uh, we are very conservative in those in those recommendations that we make. The city's budget uh, is adopted altogether, but there are almost 20 individual funds that make up the city's budget. Some of those are legally required. Some of those uh, we have established to allow for uh, better accounting and tracking and transparency purposes. So as we go through the process, um, we'll focus primarily on the general fund, which is our operating fund, and that covers the work that we do in all of our operating departments, police, public works, parks and recreation, administration, community development. And then um, our, our next set of discussions really center around the, our five-year capital improvement program and the funds that support that and our capital infrastructure projects. So ultimately in August, all of those will be adopted together, but they'll come forward in pieces uh, throughout the year. One thing I did want to mention was that we're going to have a little bit with a new um, CIP committee that we have in place now. That was actually a goal, and going back through and looking at goals and objectives from the 2013 uh, City Council uh, goal setting process, getting that Citizen CIP committee in place was a, was a goal. So they are now in place, and they will actually, historically staff has kind of prepared that and then brought the CIP to the council. Um, we are working as a staff with the CIP to prepare that, and so we'll actually bring forward a recommendation that has been considered or is being made by the, the Citizen Capital Improvement Committee when we bring uh, that five-year CIP, CIP plan forward to you um, in relationship to the 2019 budget. So next slide. Oh, sorry. Two slides. Oops, sorry. There we go. <laughs> so just a little bit about different budget philosophies and approaches. Sometimes you hear about things, uh, zero-based budgeting. <coughs> Uh, incremental budgeting, performance-based budgeting, priority-based budgeting. Zero-based budgeting uh, is essentially where you start at zero each year and you have to justify your program costs um, and any expenses that you have. Performance-based or priority-based budgeting is really where we're allocating funds based on results that contribute to our organizational goals. And then incremental budgeting is really just as it would suggest where you're using the previous year as your starting point and looking at incremental increases. We have traditionally used the incremental budgeting approach, and that's the approach that we will take in 2019. Um, ultimately, I think I would like to see us move in the direction of more priority-based or performance-based budgeting, but without that clear set of goals and objectives and priorities, it's difficult uh, to build a budget structure around that. So just wanted to sort of get those out there because you'll hear uh, as you start to see these stories about other cities, uh, uh, some cities approach um, their budgets from this different perspective. Laura, yes. I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. Have, I have to ask you, is that your decision on how we're going to, which approach we're going to take? No, it would be my recommendation, and then ultimately you can direct us as a staff to what uh, approach. Or I was wondering, or does that come from Ron? Is that uh, the mayor that kind of? I think it's. I think it's a combination. Um, I mean, certainly, if you're interested in, uh, you know, the performance-based budgeting, and, and the mayor has an interest in that, um, that direction would come down to staff, and we'll figure out how to do it. But I think ultimately, you know, in looking, and, and I'll jump ahead a little bit to some of the things as we were talking about um, in the survey that that I sent out to you last Friday, and some of your responses about what do you think the citizens need to know. A lot of that was transparency, how their dollars are being spent, a clearer picture. Uh, of how those funds are being used um, and the priority-based or performance-based budgeting can help us accomplish that, um, connecting those goals. No, that's okay. Good question. Please stop me at any point. Um, next slide. So in 2019, our goals and objectives are going to come from a variety of sources. I included in your memo just sort of the results of the SWOT analysis that we did at our February retreat. I, that is not an inclusive list um, because there were some things that uh, really don't necessarily have budgetary impact. So I tried in the, in the memo that I provided <coughs> on Monday to really just look at those things which I think have a direct budgetary impact. And so over the course of uh, additional conversations, we'll go back and pick up that list of complete. Uh, I think I sent this, the complete SWOT analysis to you um, and included in this memo just those things uh, that will center around programs and services that we deliver. Um, public input, we are planning uh, at the end of May to have uh, 
kind of a community conversation uh, where we solicit uh, priorities, project goals, suggestions, concerns uh, from the residents. We haven't done that. Um, we've had a community conversation about the budget. Um, sometimes it's been better attended than others in previous years, but we haven't really started uh, early in the budget process soliciting that feedback. Um, in, in the survey that um, that you all received on Friday, if everybody um, was unanimous in their you know, agreement that they wanted to see a similar survey go out. And so we'll, we'll do that via our website and social media ahead of this meeting and then maybe try to build on that. My thought being that, you know, last year we asked each of the departments to do kind of a brief presentation on their programs and services and provide some, some data and statistics and, and really just create some context about the services that they're delivering. And I would envision that we would do something similar just um, so that the public who attend at the end of this month have that opportunity to have some context around uh, the things that we may be talking about. And then several things were identified uh, in the council budget survey, which I provided you a, a copy of uh, this evening. So there may be things that we add to and change uh, from that. You'll see as you look at that, there's a lot of similarity. Um, and so we'll, we'll touch on a couple of those things a little bit more specifically here before we get out of here tonight, but um, obviously the SWOT analysis, um, the council budget survey uh, will bring forward as, as your professional staff those things uh, which we see from our perspective and we do that each year as a part of the budget process uh, and then that public input. So all of those things will feed into our conversations about goals and objectives and priorities uh, in the 2019 budget. So then, um, just briefly, one of the things that we've had a lot of conversation and questions, uh, both in Mission and really throughout Johnson County over the last month and a half or so, is the increases that um, we're seeing in assessed valuation, um, particularly in the northeast part of the county and the impact that that may have. So in Mission, our overall values, uh, property values, are expected to increase uh, by about 11.6%, and that's being driven primarily by a 16.1% increase in residential properties, and a four in, increase in our commercial properties is 4.75%. I know one of the things, a comment that I saw, I think, on a, a Shiny Mission Post story last week was talking about how uh, the commercial assessed valuations in Mission were just increasing much more dramatically than the residential valuations. And so, you know, this information from the appraiser really sort of suggests otherwise. Um, Laura, I have one question on uh -huh. that. I know residential, we were on the high end. Do you know commercial, how we matched up? Like, was that a big increase compared to neighboring areas or? Uh, no, but I'll, I, I'll pull that information. I think in his overall revaluation report, it will talk about countywide what that, okay. what that value is. Um, so obviously, um, you know, that for, for many, 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 many years, um, you know, increasing your assessed valuation, uh, increasing the value of your community, underlying values in your community was absolutely, it continues to be a goal. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways. We do that through encouraging density. We do that through investments in the infrastructure. Uh, we do that through property maintenance uh, codes uh, in our residential neighborhoods and our commercial areas. So there are a variety of ways that, that we can do that. Um, and, and until the 2017 budget, um, the council had complete discretion to set the mill levy each year as a part of that annual budget process. And it's never an easy conversation. It's never been an easy conversation. Um, when you see increases in assessed valuation like we saw this year, and to a certain extent like we saw last year, because we've had two years of fairly significant increases, um, there is a concern from residents and, and property owners, business owners, that you know, it will Im impact their taxes, raise their taxes, even by paying that same mill levy. And so oftentimes there may be a cry for a reduction in the mill levy. And we want to be very careful as we go through the process to make sure that we're having a conversation about what do we want as a and need as a community um, 
what ability and tolerance do we have to fund those wants and needs, and then um, I think have a very thoughtful and transparent conversation about um, how that translates into a corresponding levy. We're now subject to a state imposed property tax lid, and so uh, there are certainly limitations that we're still learning and adjusting to um, as we go through this process. Uh, so it's very likely that we may not be able to take advantage of all of the increase in assessed valuation that we have. So um, we now have to compare um, the increase in our assessed valuation to a, a CPI average. Uh, and then without going to a vote of the public, um, we're only allowed to sort of take advantage of that, that CPI increase. So there's the potential that when you have large increases, you may actually have to roll back your mill levy in order to comply uh, with, with the property tax load. So th those will all be things as we start to develop um, more of the specific numbers as we go through the budget process that we'll have conversations around uh, and what opportunities we have um, and really want to be able to engage those citizens in those conversations as well. But I think you know one of the things that's important to do is to really look at that those increases in assessed valuation in context. And um, oftentimes um, we forget to look back and remember that um, if we look back over a really a 10-year horizon, we are just in 2017. We were just returning to the same levels of assessed valuation in our community that we had in 2007. So from 2008 to 2013, we actually saw declining um, assessed valuation in, here in Mission, as did most of the other cities in Johnson County. It was really unprecedented throughout the county. Um, so we had to learn how to adjust to that. Um, and you know, we did have a mill levy increase uh, during that time period, um, but they were very specific in converting some other uh, fees and things into that mill levy. And so that's why in uh, your memo I included that, going all the way back to 2002, kind of the history of our mill levy and fee increases, so you can kind of track uh, what has happened there. So when you look at sort of that context of um, from 2007 to 2017, really the increase in assessed valuation is only about 9%, 8 to 9% overall. Um, the other thing that, that we always are sensitive to, um, and we'll provide additional information as we go through the budget process, is what portion of a resident's total tax bill is really made up of your city uh, taxes and fees. And when we look at an average home tax liability uh, in Mission, and if you got your Johnson County magazine in the mail this week, you, you saw kind of a similar comparison. They had a pie chart that sort of broke out. Uh, the county's uh, piece of that as well. So it's important to um, to look at that as, and it's a comparison that many use. But the average for tw the 2017 tax bills, the average home price in Mission was 170, appraised value was 175,000 uh, roughly. Um, and so a total tax bill of all t taxing jurisdictions with a mill levy of about $2,400. Um, so if you look at this pie chart, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> the school district is always going to be the largest portion of the tax bill. Um, the city really makes up about 15% um, of that. Um, now, when you add our taxes and fees, whether it's stormwater and the solid waste utility fees, um, we are a much higher percentage than that. Um, so we will look at that as part of that total conversation. So we will always look at total of tax burden, tax and fee burden, or liability as we make those decisions going through uh, the process. The best news, I think, mm -hmm. going into the 2019 budget, which um, we would, you would have heard if we did have the audit presentation this evening, is what has happened with our general fund fund balance. Uh, City Council has an established policy that we will maintain a 25% of general, annual general fund revenues as a fund balance or essentially cash reserves in the general fund. Um, the chart here, the blue line, shows you what our general actual general fund fund balance has been since 2008, and the green line shows the goal. 
Um, you can see a big dip in 2010, and that was a specific drawdown of general fund fund balance to restructure some existing stormwater debt that was related to the Gateway Project and a, and a commitment to um, rebuild that over time. And you can see that for several years, um, not you know, interestingly enough, coinciding with declining assessed valuations and decreasing revenues over that same period of time, we, we didn't lose ground in terms of fund balance, but we weren't gaining um, very much. That was also a period of time where we weren't giving employee raises. There were a lot of other things that we, we were doing. We had deferred um, equipment purchases and things like that. Starting in 2014, um, we really started to kind of see some increases in, uh, in rebuilding that uh, general fund fund balance primarily through increases in the use tax. So we were very cautious and very conservative in building those things into our budget and spending them in a particular year because the use tax um, can be can fluctuate very wildly from year to year. Um, we don't want to count on it. So every several years we would get kind of this big spike in use tax. Well, one of the things that you can, can see, and, and we'll see if you looked at the audit, we'll talk in more detail through the audit presentation, is our sales tax revenues have been really very strong since 2014, and those have been the primary drivers uh, in our ability to rebuild that general fund, fund balance. So what I think will be an interesting exercise for us in the 2019 budget, and, and Councilmember Cream touched on one of those issues, and that is the impact of the Planet Fitness effect on the community center revenues. We, we are still sort of, I think, having to readjust to what is our new normal in terms of how we forecast and predict both revenues and expenses. Um, but when we look at the implications of the property tax lid, and as we sort of get our heads and, and arms around that more solidly in, in coming years, we maybe look at sales tax trends a little bit differently if we look at the impacts on some of the other revenue streams. Um, we'll be making some adjustments to forecasting. So we probably won't spend a lot of time this year looking at those forecasting models necessarily uh, because several of them I think have been turned on their ears a little bit. Um, so it, it's something that we definitely want to get back to. Um, but you can see that um, where we ended the year in 2017, we had the general fund fund balance of just uh, slightly over $5 million. Now, if you read the fine print in the audit, you'll see that there are some things that are restricted or assigned in that general fund fund balance. Do you want to read it right now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think I almost, almost have it committed to memory. But um, so that includes um, the to, there's 226,000 uh, roughly for the phones, cameras, cabling that you all approved at your last meeting. Um, there is $308,000 for the equipment reserve fund that we started building last year and will contribute another $100,000 to in the 2018 budget. That was a goal that the council has had for years. Um, really excited to see that. There's a, a hundred plus thousand dollars of ADA funds that are um, set aside, and what have I missed? Did I get it all? Yeah, it okay. So when you take all of those things that are restricted or signed off, then we have just a little over, I think, four point two million dollars in unrestricted general fund fund balance. Which is great, but why can't you have those separated? Why do you have to have that all included in the general fund balance and not have their own funds for those dollar amounts? Well, we, uh, it just makes it not so general on the general fund. <laughs> yeah. So well, I think none of the <coughs> things, well, we had originally intended to set up a separate equipment reserve fund. And when we, when we no. went through the audit. Yeah, there is a separate equipment reserve fund. But for auditing purposes, reporting purposes, we had this discussion with the auditors. Do we treat it as a standalone fund? Or do we just kind of roll it in with a general fund? It was decided that it's be easier to roll it in with a general fund because okay. those are really kind of general fund capital dollars. They're going to make purchases for the general fund, primarily vehicles. So we just kind of tucked it underneath the general fund for reporting purposes. Okay. But do you have you have separate like police equipment? Is that right. like police? Right. Yeah. Well, all that's within the uh, equipment reserve fund. Right. And then you know, for accounting purposes on our side of the accounting book, you know, we have those. 
those dollars obviously allocated out so we're tracking from the ADA, the equipment reserve fund, the amount of it reserved for computer equipment. So that like when I look at my balance on my bank account online, yeah. it shows your actual balance and available balance. <laughs> There's a little bit of a difference. <laughs> now when I look at my balance, I got to think, oh, I got some Christmas money coming up and I got a trip coming up, so right. I'll spend it all. Yeah. So, good expenses. Well, and I think, too, because some of the things that we have them resigned, assigned or restricted for are not legal restrictions necessarily. And so it would take an action of the council to sort of move those into another category. But you would. I mean, if we found ourselves in really dire straits, you yeah. would have the ability to go in and say, we, we want to designate those ADA funds or reallocate those funds. So that's certainly within your kind of within your purview. No, that's cool. He explained the okay. auditors looked at it and they did. So, yep. so that means that we um, anticipate ending the 2018 fiscal year with about a million two in excess fund balance. So when we then carve out our 25% fund balance goal, and we could potentially restrict that, that could actually become a restricted, show as a restricted fund balance reserves. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so we have a $1.2 million, uh, which is, it, it's great. We know we obviously we want to be good stewards of that. We want to think about um, the best way to use that. And so as we go through the budget process, we'll look at the other projects and priorities that we have. And so some of those, um, and I just wanted to run through a couple. Yeah, uh, yeah next slide. Um, some of the things I just have a question. I think uh -huh. there's a Supreme Court case out there regarding sales tax on where items are delivered as opposed to. So. <laughs> well, the Dodge is Yeah, the Wayfair case, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was that a, in South Dakota, I think. I think they're going to roll out on it in July, maybe. Yeah, Early June. The court heard the case last, a couple weeks ago, and kind of the initial read and the court's reactions are not favorable. It is? Okay. So. Probably staying the way it is right now. Okay. Because I didn't know if we were going to look at that. It's kind of the that or... predictions that are out there. But yeah, the final decision will come from the Supreme Court this summer. Okay. And then the dark store, like RC was talking about, do we have any idea when that's going to come to resolution? No. And how that might impact so, the budget for 2018? Yeah. Um, it's called the dark store. <laughs> So these big box retailers like Walmart, Target, Ivy, uh, even CVS have all claimed that that they shouldn't be appraised on the traditional appraisal process for their properties. Instead, their property should be treated as if they were closed and they were just an empty shell building, and it's hard to kind of find a new tenant for an empty shell building, especially one the size of Walmart or Target. So they made an appeal to the uh, Kansas Board of Tax Adjustments, the BTOA, and the BTOA kind of turned that idea down. Then they came back with another theory called kind of a hypothetical lease, which is sort of kind of half between a dark store and the full assessed value of the building as it is. So that's going through the appeal process right now. And each, each county is kind of going through a separate appeal process. So there's Wyandotte County, Shawnee County, some others in Kansas. Johnson County's appeal will be heard sometime this summer. Now the county assessor has gone ahead and identified the potential impact for all the cities. And they gave us a number a few weeks ago at a meeting. For us, it's about 85000 that we could potentially lose if the appeal. Yeah, it's, it's not, not as bad as, 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 yeah. as the first number they threw yeah. at us yeah. three, so three months ago. That number reflects about three years' worth of assessed value. And it's kind of an evolving number. It's always squishing. So they said, don't bank on it because it could change a little bit. But right now, for us, as of today, it's about 85000 That's kind of the worst case scenario. We'd have to give back 85,000. We lost the appeal. The county lost the appeal. Well, and again, I think that's where you know some of the, the comments that we saw in the survey and, and in our SWOT analysis was kind of this concern about business um, stagnation or 
who've been on the news lately about vacancies on Johnson Drive. You know, the, the sales tax revenues that we've seen for the last several years, including 2017, would not suggest that we're seeing that. Um, and so we, but again, I think there are other things that are looming out there on the horizon. I think the face of retail continues to change, and I think that's where we need to continue to be very diligent and very conservative in looking at how we budget and use those resources, uh, and whether you know whether we commit them to one-time expenses versus ongoing operating expenses and, and some of those kinds of things. Um, and, and also, certainly, we have to look at that. Um, you know, the perception of vacancies of businesses in our community um, is cer certainly has different impacts. It may not have a direct budgetary impact, but it does impact other uh, other things. So, some of the things that we will be talking about as we move through the budget process, uh, an update to the comprehensive plan, that was something that we started back in 2015 uh, and just uh, sort of died on the vine primarily because we had a lot of staff uh, tra transition and turnover. That's certainly something that we will be bringing back uh, for your consideration. A direction finder survey update. We have historically uh, gone every four years to the community to talk to them about priorities. Our last survey was in 2015, so the 2019 budget would uh, we would be on track uh, to have that next four-year cycle, which I think matches up and lines up nicely with some of the other things that we want to accomplish. Uh, we talk about a space needs analysis here at City Hall and the Police Department. Um, you know, that we have ADA issues, we've got as the chief and, and the department have increased uh, the number of female officers, uh, locker room issues, both male and female. Um, just quite honestly, you know, basic carpet, paint, walls, there's a lot of things in this building, um, inside and out. Uh, but, I, but I think we want to approach that in terms of, you know, one of, one of the biggest challenges we have is the space that we do have is not organized efficiently for the work that we do. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about that at the February retreat. Sometimes the, the layout of City Hall doesn't make it very customer friendly um, when you first come in. And, and so even as, as we start to change some of these minor things, it's difficult because you're spending money and then you're not really reorganizing or creating those efficiencies in workspace. Uh, some of the um, major challenges we see with, um, if we start to, to look at major renovations to this building, uh, the need to, to put a sprinkler system in. Um, so there's some significant costs. We did a space needs analysis in 2010 that was driven primarily by the court uh, and the size of the court dockets, and we were exceeding fire code capacity with almost every court docket. That has changed. That's really not the driver any longer, but I think it's time for us to probably come back and look at an updated space needs analysis that also looks to the future to say, as we consider um, the things that we may need uh, in terms of increases in staffing for particularly the police department as we bring new development online, can we accommodate that in this, you know, in this building? So that's certainly something we'll have uh, some conversation around. The animal control service delivery model, um, since I think 1974 maybe, we've had the Northeast Animal Control Commission, which is uh, sort of an interlocal agreement among six communities in Northeast Johnson County to provide animal control services. Um, for several years we've been having conversations about some cities' um, concerns about level of service and cost and a variety of different things, and I think as uh, as we, Mission, who is the largest um, city who participates, we contribute about 70, somewhere between 75 and 80 thousand dollars a year uh, to participate. Um, we think there may be some opportunities for us to get more value for that. Um, so we do have a Northeast Animal Control Commission meeting tomorrow evening, um, where we will be recommending that we look at hiring community service officers here who can not only provide animal control services, but uh, report taking, uh, vehicle transports, a variety of other things. Um, and then we would look at offering animal control services contractually to the other cities. Um, and so it, this is a conversation that's been going on for months, so it's not a surprise to the other cities. Tomorrow night, um, we're really going to kind of start to delve into the co what the, that cost model might look like. And so our goal would be, um, we'll get through that, and then when we come back to you with a general fund recommendation, 
we hope to be able to say, and we believe the following cities may be interested in contracting with us, and kind of supplementing those expenses. I put solid waste contract on here only because I it just today I got a letter from waste management, um, and we will be seeing a little over a three percent increase in our solid waste uh, fees going into 2019. Uh, they can. Under our contract, they can have an increase up to 5% before we can really reopen negotiations on that. Um, but I did want to put it out there. The, the, con the current contract with them is actually good through December of 2019. So in 2019, we would be looking at going through an RFP process uh, and looking at uh, going back out for solid waste uh, contract services. I mean, we could certainly do that earlier, but I think um, one of the things we also talked about in February was staff capacity, uh, and I think it would be our recommendation to say that the increase is manageable. Let's let's keep it on the regular cycle because we have some other services on call engineering and some other things that uh, will take staff time in 2018. I touched briefly already on kind of finding that new normal for revenue projections in a lot of different categories. Um, a reevaluation of street program. I think the number one theme if, uh, that was sort of screaming out of your council budget goals survey was infrastructure streets, infrastructure streets, infrastructure streets. So we, we know that. We did an updated street condition rating inventory with Stantec last year. We have spent and continue to spend a tremendous amount of time internally as a staff kind of looking at that and trying to make some sense of it. Um, it uh, I think we talked for probably the last year about thinking we probably need to sort of blow up our existing street program and repackage and repurpose it, reprioritize our goals, and I think that's that's coming. So um, we're looking at, and it will first go again to the CIP committee, but I think we're looking at um, how do we continue the progress that we've made. We don't want to lose ground. We want to continue um, to demonstrate uh, our commitment to maintaining streets and the transportation infrastructure network. Um, but how do we look at that and how do we get our heads around um, really what we need to and can accomplish both physically and financially over the next probably five to ten years. So I know one of the other things in, in the survey was looking at um, what could we do with some debt uh, scenarios to look at sort of accelerating that and so we will certainly be able to bring some of those forward. You know, one of the challenges that we will have is the current um, transport or street sales tax is set to expire in 2022. So we'll want to, we're going to have an opportunity to renew that. Um, so we'll have to carefully look at any any debt obligations based on existing revenue streams. Uh, park master plan implementation again, a budget issue. One of the things. Um, because I know we had conversations internally, and some of you have asked me questions like tonight. We uh, looked at the leasing of the cardio equipment, and so I've had the question: Well, now that we have the parks and recreation sales tax, why do we lease? Why do we incur interest expenses versus just purchasing those things outright? Well, when you look at that two hundred thousand dollar expenditure, we are still playing catch up with that parks and recreation sales tax in terms of the maintenance that's happening at the community center and the things that we want to start implementing in in our outdoor park system. And so if we take a $200,000 chunk out for cardio, we're taking away from and probably can't accomplish as many of the things that we want to do in some of those other areas. So we're still trying to balance that. Ideally, at some point, we'd love to, to be able to move away from a lease arrangement for something like that. Are we about where uh, we can pay this pool off early and then all the, those funds will be going toward the uh, I don't think you're there, there yet. I, I don't. I'll look and see. I'll look and see what the where what more where the call yeah. provision. I think our call provision. We're still. What'd you say? A couple more. Couple more years. That's still early. Yeah. That's absolutely. Um, plan review and building inspection services. This is one that um, we've been working on. We will continue to work on uh, with Daniel's transition. So that will be certainly a topic of conversation. Um, and, and really sort of, you know, much, much more. Um, what, always, are we, what are we doing in the interim for plan review? Who's reviewing plans? Uh, I know. <coughs> yeah. 
But that's not, I mean, we're looking at sure. how we can take that off of his plate. To but as long as we're lapsing that FTE, we're keeping that information updated, right, with the lapse of the, I mean, if we don't fill that for six months, that's a six month increase that we have based on. Yes, and that's, you know, that, you know, honestly, the, the challenges that we saw in staffing in the police department in 2017 is one of the things that contributed to an increase in, you know, the fund balance is because we had those uh, salary savings. One of the other things that I didn't put on this list, which is obviously very important, is you know, we did uh, approve the classification and compensation study in 2017, and we certainly want to be able to continue to move um, that structure and that process forward and, and remain competitive. So that will certainly be part of our conversations as well. Uh-huh. When we talk about the solid waste contract, one of the questions I have as it relates to street children is to what degree by having three trucks go through every week, is that impacting our pavement deterioration? Because they they have a truck for the trash pickup, they have a truck for the uh, uh, guard waste, and they have a truck for the recycling. Recycle. So you have three trucks every week going through and basically with a lot of weight. And I'm just wondering to what degree does that impact street deterioration? Well, I think it certainly has an impact. I, I don't. We can't control the separation issue any longer. Well, one one really big track that would do it all would be a lot worse harvest. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing too, and what we'll hear when we go through and, and when we have the conversation about rebidding the contract is, do we have a single source hauler, or do we allow residents to select their own haulers? And you and when, if you open that up, that's where you get into some of those conversations about you may have. Four different, yeah. four different haulers oh, yeah. with three different, you know, trucks on your street. So that's where the impact on your street can really start to, to take effect. At the league's governing body institute, they said, do not do that. Don't let your city do that. Don't let your city do what? Do open it Do up. Open, yeah. open contract. It's terrible for your street. Yeah. yeah. So that that's really where you start to have that. And unfortunately, with the yeah. county regula regulations. Well, I'm just thinking we have list. development, you know, yeah. so a lot of demolition and the you know, concrete trucks, it all creates a lot of activity and it essentially breaks down our streets. It does and I think that's one of the things that I think you've heard John talk about for a couple of years is really getting street standards, uh, street construction standards established. Um, we didn't ha haven't had historically that consistency and so I think you see sometimes some deterioration or degradation. Uh, that, that we might not have if we'd had certain standards in place. So that's certainly a goal as we invest the money in street infrastructure going forward. We want to make sure that we can withstand and we want to think about those kinds of things. That's really all I kind of have um, this evening. Just want to touch briefly on kind of our schedule. Um, the departments just submitted their budgets um, the first of this week. Uh, so the Kind of work and reconciliation um, is happening internally. We're looking at that community conversation on the 30th of May. In June, we'll talk about the general we'll present the general fund budget first, and then we'll talk about your five-year CIP. In July, uh, we'll kind of review and discuss a proposed budget, and then take that proposed budget out to a community dialogue at the end of July, looking at your formal public hearing on the 29th team budget on August 1st and adoption on the 15th of August. No question. Uh -huh. uh, has Uncle Tom Valenti uh, given you a date for a golden <laughs> shovel moment? <laughs> it's going to be a diamond. <laughs> golden. How's it, how are they doing on the payback? Fees, etc. So, has there been any progress on that? They are. Yeah. They are submitting plans for review. So they, are. they submit uh, plans for public improvements this week. I talked with Matt. He had, they hired an architect to do interior work in the hotel. They met with Marriott and talked about expectations and design and so forth. 
we have another meeting at the, at the end of this month, May, with Marriott again. So they are making progress. Yeah. Do you think it'll be a 2018 big day? They're hoping to break ground late summer, early fall. Okay. And they they cannot, I mean, the condition of issuance of the building permit is that their taxes are current. So. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Question. Our committee meeting in July is on the 4th of July. That's why you saw, I think you're, it's a July 11th date, so I think we've adjusted, so you, the committee meeting will be on the 11th oh, okay. of July that month. Well, I think it's the, that's the second Wednesday, is that? Well, you guys saw it going on on the Yeah, it's almost like up the five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so again, that's going to be on the 11th? Yes. Yeah. And then at one point, we said, had a resolution to go ahead and have all the star dates. 6.30, start times. You passed a resolution, or you made a motion last council meeting. And then, uh, I noticed that some of these dates were on, like, actual city council nights. Are they still going to retain at 7 o'clock, I'm assuming? So, your, yes. So, your, your August 15th meeting is going to be your council meeting, right? And then I think that's yeah. the only one. Okay, all right, cool. All right, thank you. As I said, if you had specific questions um, in your review of the audit that you want to get to Brian, um, be sure we can get those answered for you. Um, that's all I thought your summary letters were good. Uh, that's very helpful. Well, if there's nothing else, I'd say we adjourn and try to beat the weather. Try to beat the weather.